Are you? Am I what? Discreet. Yes, I'm discreet. Me too. Two stars, anxious to reinvent their on-screen images. A producing team badly in need of a hit. We were sure that Paramount was not going to want to renew our deal. And an eccentric, exacting director. I used to generate a bit of chaos. And there were times I wanted to kill him. We'd have furious fights, furious. Join forces in the fall of 1986 to turn a short diversion. We were attracted to each other at the party. Obvious. into a fatal attraction. You're on your own for the night, that's also obvious. But the challenging premise was no easy sell. How can you root for a character, your protagonist, when he cheats on his wife 10 minutes into the film? Every studio, I think, passed on it twice. Facing obstacles every step of the way. He said, I can't do the movie with Michael Douglas. He said, it's him or me. Right down to the crucial casting of its leading lady. Every actress who was anybody wanted the part. A role obsessively pursued by an unlikely candidate. She's one of the greatest actresses in the entire world. But she's completely wrong for the part. I couldn't get it out of my head. Yeah, you don't give up, do you? You just don't give up. And just when things were coming together, an 11th hour change to the film's ending. It doesn't work. You're left frustrated. Sorry, your husband's <laughs> under arrest. It wasn't an emotional, cathartic finish. Turned the creative team against each other. I don't think I like this. It was betraying her to make her into a psychopath. I actually saw her eyes tearing up, and she said, you can take me to Bedford in a straitjacket, but you can't make me do it and threatened to sink the entire project. He said, well, the studio aren't going to release the movie unless we change the ending. But the film, like its spurned female lead, wasn't about to go away quietly. I'm not going to be ignored, Dan. The movie pushed boundaries. When I saw the love scenes, I thought, that's fresh. It was erotic. It really looked like they were going at it. And got America talking. It was a way to get a conversation started about these private details of sexuality, desire, and secrets people keep. And a quarter century later, Fatal Attraction has boiled over into the pop culture consciousness. In England, a woman who pursues a man relentlessly is called a bunny boiler. I love animals. I'm a great cook sending its players into exciting new directions and kicking off a new trend in film. It hit that right note, was executed well, and has been copied ever since. <laughs> this is the inside story of the seminal erotic thriller that just wouldn't die. <laughs> In 1987, teen moviegoers were thrilling to Jason Voorhees' seventh summer at Camp Crystal Lake and Freddy Krueger's third trip to Elm Street. But elsewhere in the multiplex, <laughs> grown-ups were thrilling to a new kind of cinematic nightmare. Daddy! I'm not going to be ignored, Dan. The story of fatal attraction about a happily married man terrorized after a one-night stand. I feel you. I taste you. I think you. Touched a nerve. A man has an affair, and it's the worst nightmare. Is this what you want to talk about, our imaginary love affair? I'm pregnant. It touched a subject matter that was under the surface that no one was talking about, and it just blew it out. Inside the film's story, some found a deeper commentary on the time period. One sexual act could not only stay with you for the rest of your life, but it could potentially end your life. And I think Fatal Attraction really picks up on that. If it had been released five years earlier or five years later, I think it still might have been a hit movie because I think it's a good thriller, but I don't think it would have been on the cover of Time magazine and People magazine in the same week. Yes, <laughs> And when audiences stopped screaming, 
they started talking. It's a morality tale. If you cheat on your wife, here are some of the things that could happen to you, and they're terrible. It succeeds very well at this morality play, which is teaching men to keep it in their pants. More than a few husbands reported being dragged to the film by their wives. Well, I think they pushed them to see what hideous stuff could await them. The film was anchored by two standout performances. Michael Douglas as Dan Gallagher, a husband trapped by his moment of weakness. <laughs> it was exciting and dangerous because this was a flawed character. I've always enjoyed playing characters. So you put them in this unbelievably impossible predicament and uh, the audience enjoys you trying to get out of it. The 42-year-old Douglas had made strides in Hollywood as the son of Golden Age movie star Kirk Douglas, but had yet to match his father's on-screen accomplishments. Michael Douglas had been living in that shadow of one of the biggest movie stars in Hollywood history, but it was really a film like Fatal Attraction, the kind of movie that his dad never could have made, that truly put Michael Douglas in his own separate place. Hi, darling. Opposite Douglas was Glenn Close as Alex Forrest. Haven't we met somewhere before? A career woman who turns the one night stand into something dangerous. For me, I developed a huge empathy and love for that character. When I knew I was gonna do it, the thing that I had the biggest questions about, number one, whether this behavior is possible, and number two, if it is, why? What would cause somebody to do that? And that was my process. I'll tell your wife. You tell my wife, I'll kill you. It only takes a phone call! She threw herself right into it and uh, was fearless and completely sexual in the part. And I think that it really is the kind of a role that totally changed the way people looked at her because previously she had been much more of the serious part, much more of the sisterly part, and all of a sudden here she was as a, a temptress, as, as a vixen, and as a sexy b And driving the film's vision was Adrian Lyne, described by some as an obsessive visionary with a fanatical attention to detail and an eye for the erotic. Adrian Lyne has this ability to sort of take the dirtiest sex stuff and elevate it to a level where it becomes partially beautiful, partially creepy, always completely striking. American directors make movies about heroes, mostly, and um, European directors make films about people with weakness and vulnerability. I think I've managed to do European movies in America. He understood the material at, at the core of his being. He understood it emotionally. For this assembly of talent, the journey to bring fatal attraction to the screen would be seven years long. As the 80s began, Sherry Lansing, the youngest woman to run a major Hollywood studio, decided to leave her high-powered job as the president of 20th Century Fox for one simple reason. The thing I had always wanted to do and the thing I most wanted to do was to be a producer. Um, so I decided to quit after three and a half years and fulfill my dream. Lansing partnered with veteran producer Stanley Jaffe and set up a production deal at Paramount Pictures. Dealing with them was quite easy for me because they both had been studio executives, so they understood what it was sitting on the other side of the desk. They made really terrific producers. In pursuit of material, Jaffe flew to London, where he had arranged to meet with a number of writers and directors. There's an enormous talent pool in London. And I went to London, and among the very many things that came to me while I was there were three little shorts by James Dearden, one of which was called The Version. The film, written and directed by Dearden, was an intimate snapshot of a married man's fling with an unbalanced woman. Come in. And its grave repercussions. Came up with the idea of a guy who's sitting at home on weekend, his wife goes out of town, picks up his, you know, little black book, calls this number, calls this girl he's met at a party. We were attracted to each other at the party. That's obvious. You call me tonight because you're on your own for a couple of nights. That's also obvious. Let's get the bill. Takes her out to dinner, one thing leads to another. He instigates this one-night stand. 
has a great time, rushed home, he's ruffled the bed, and the wife comes back and he kind of embraces her and thinks he's got away with it, and then the phone starts to ring. It was the first act, if you like, of the feature film. It just intrigued me, because I could see how someone could get caught up in that and get caught in it. You've had your fun, and now you just want a quiet life. This woman was a very, very familiar character to me. And I, I was very obsessed with this woman who says, I can handle this. I can be discreet. You can be discreet. This is nothing. I think she very much saw it the way I saw it, in fact, um, as a, a story of a rather tragic, lonely figure. Stanley said to me, and he said, Sherry, you're so obsessed with this. Why don't you and James go off? Spend a couple of days and see if you can come up with anything. I was so excited, I can't tell you. And that was Stanley, you know, sensing that there was maybe something more there. While Lansing was excited, Dearden was resistant. I kept coming up with other projects because I didn't want to go back and do something I'd already done, but they kept coming back to diversion. Dearden's short film was optioned. Excited at the possibility of directing his first feature, he would spend the next couple of years trying to turn the plot of Diversion into a viable feature-length film. While Dearden toiled on the script, Jaffe and Lansing developed two other features for Paramount Pictures, First Born, starring Peter Weller, and Racing with the Moon, starring Sean Penn and Elizabeth McGovern. Both were the kind of intimate, character-driven films to which Lansing was attracted. I got into the movie business because I wanted to make movies that mattered. I didn't want to make movies that were just commercial, though I really respect it. I wanted to make movies that made a difference. In 1984, First Born and Racing with the Moon were each released. They both quickly sank. Though I'm very, very proud of those films, and I think they're wonderful movies, they were not successful. Now several years into their production deal at Paramount, and with two box office disappointments on their record, Jaffe and Lansing were feeling the pressure. We were sure that Paramount was not going to want to renew our deal. They needed a hit, so Lansing and Dearden continued to wrestle with how to transform diversion into a compelling and marketable motion picture. And then at one point, I said, what if she was pregnant? And he went, like that. And then the whole script just developed from there. Because that changes the whole texture. It was taking everything to the worst case scenario, which inevitably propelled her in the end to becoming a kind of psychopathic monster. As the project took shape, it went through a series of title changes. Diversion became Affairs of the Heart, Madness of an Abandoned Woman, and eventually, and perhaps thankfully, Fatal Attraction. Jaffe and Lansing began the process of shopping their project, but their battle would be an uphill one. This is a movie that didn't get made for five years after we had the screenplay. Every studio, I think, passed on it twice. Until they reeled in no less than the godfather of the contemporary erotic thriller, Brian De Palma, a director whose participation would give the project a green light, but whose casting demands would nearly undo the film. And he said, look, it's him or me. By 1985, producers Stanley Jaffe and Sherry Lansing needed a hit. Their first two films for Paramount Pictures, First Born and Racing with the Moon, failed to even crack the top 100 of 1984's box office. As the two poured their energies into their latest project, called Fatal Attraction, they were feeling the pressure to deliver. The production scored an early victory when 42-year-old Michael Douglas expressed an interest in the film. We had such a strong through line as to what exactly this, this was all about. I mean, it was very simple, you know, you made a mistake, and what are the worst possible uh, consequences of making a mistake? And I've always loved those kind of moral uh, issues, moral questions. The actor, son of Hollywood legend Kirk Douglas, had achieved some measure of success on television with The Streets of San Francisco and in such films as The China Syndrome and The Star Chamber. By 1985, Douglas had scored a hit with the tongue-in-cheek swashbuckler Romancing the Stone, but his biggest success in the industry had come as a producer, winning the 1975 Best Picture Oscar for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. At that time, Michael wasn't a huge star. He had been very successful in television, but he was thought as much of as a producer. 
Jaffe and Lansing saw Douglas as an asset, a star with a producer's sensibilities. I kind of see the big picture, you know, even, even if I'm not producing, you know, I, I kind of know what my responsibility as an actor is for a scene for it to work, and I know what the other people's responsibilities are to make the scene work. But there is that other, my other eye, which is out there kind of watching, watching the whole thing. Michael would come to a lot of the script meetings. His input was very helpful because he was trying to figure out how he could play it uh, 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 and still retain sympathy without destroying the premise, which is, after all, a guy who does, you know, go out on a one-night stand and cheat on his wife, and there's no getting away from that. He makes you believe in everything he does, and he never seems like he's acting. It just seems so natural. And I also think he's one of the most likable characters I've ever seen. With the leading man attached, Jaffe and Lansing took their project to Paramount executives, who promptly passed. They all said, how can you root for a character when he cheats on his wife 10 minutes into the film? They weren't alone. Every studio, I think, passed on it twice. You could make the script as good as you like. You could cast it as well as you could. You could get the hottest director and the best producers, but you were fatally flawed by the fact that you had a non-hero. The production's star had begun to voice some misgivings about working with a novice director. Initially, he was quite happy for me to direct it because he'd seen Diversion. He liked the movie. Uh, I think he then did a movie where he'd worked with a first-time director and it hadn't been a great experience. So I was, like, uh, dropped as the director, which was, you know, at the time disappointing, but kept on as a writer, which I now realize was actually quite unusual, and I, I'm very glad I was. A solution to Douglas's concern came in late 1985, when a filmmaker who had taken up Alfred Hitchcock's mantle as a director of stylish thrillers was drawn to the film's psychosexual, nightmarish plot. We kept going to directors, we kept going to directors, we kept going to directors. And finally, one of the finest directors that exists, a man named Brian De Palma, said yes. And we were thrilled. With such films as Dress to Kill, Blowout, and Body Double to his credit, De Palma seemed a perfect fit for Fatal Attraction. When Jaffe and Lansing returned to Paramount with De Palma attached, they discovered the studio had changed their tune. And that yes by Brian De Palma was enough to get Paramount to say yes, because they were big fans of his. De Palma's involvement was the life preserver the floundering project had been waiting for. So Brian said yes, Michael was thrilled. I was really counting on and believing in this movie and had worked on it for years. And I remember my mother was like calling me and worried about me being a producer. But now I was able to call my mother and I was able to say, Mom, I got, you know, Brian De Palma, Michael Douglas, Stanley and I are going to do this movie. With a green light from the studio, pre-production began on Fatal Attraction. Brian he started to scout locations and he started to work with the writer to make certain changes in the script. By the time Brian De Palma was attached, the end of 1985, and that was draft number five of the movie. Dearden reworked his script, turning in a draft written specifically for De Palma. We had quite a few meetings in New York and was very enthusiastic, very gung-ho, and but wanted to make it more of an out-and-out -out shocker. I did a completely different version that was kind of insane in retrospect, which sort of had her in a kabuki mask on Halloween night, running around with a long knife, threatening the child, you know, out in the suburbs. But De Palma would never see this draft. And we were about, oh, I'd say less than 10 weeks from the start of principal photography. And he came in and he said, I have to talk to you. And he said, look, I love this project. He said, I think it can be a giant hit. He said, there's only one problem. And we said, what? He said, I can't do the movie with Michael Douglas. And we said, what? And he said, I think he's a great actor, but I don't think he's sympathetic and I don't think the audience will go with him. We need to go with someone else. Um, he had another actor in mind and he wanted to do it. It was a bombshell for the two producers who needed the movie to happen, but who also felt a loyalty to Douglas. I said, Michael's been there from the beginning. We really believe in Michael. And he said, look, it's him or me. In a move that threatened to sink the project entirely, Jaffe and Lansing decided to back their star. De Palma left the film. 
I must say, and Sherry and Stanley stood up for me, and we, we lost that uh, that director. Said, no, we're not going to do it without Michael. And I think that's one of the reasons that I love Stanley so much, because it was an easy decision for both of us. We knew that if Brian De Palma walked away from the movie, the movie was over. They greenlit the project on the basis of Brian De Palma saying yes. And so we called up the studio. <laughs> they said, come home. <laughs> I called my mother. She said, you really should think about going back to teaching. Jaffe and Lansing braced for the worst. But to their surprise, Paramount didn't pull the plug, but did push their start date back. And I think finally Paramount got bored with our overhead and figured we might as well do something. The pair began to search for De Palma's replacement. They'd soon find one in a British director who had a knack for stories about the dark side of sensuality and a reputation as a brilliant but also obsessive filmmaker. Fatal Attraction was adrift. Just weeks before the start of principal photography, its star director, Brian De Palma, backed out after producers refused to replace leading man Michael Douglas. And I remember thinking at the time how sad it was, because I like Brian. But my loyalty, my obligation, every moral decision was to Michael Douglas, who had been there with us from the beginning, had been there when 20 directors said no, who had never walked away, who had hung in with us. And on top of it all, I thought he was the uniquely right person for the part. So we told Michael that Brian had turned in a script that was completely unacceptable to us. And we told him that we were moving away from Brian. And he was really disappointed. But we never told him the real reason that Brian De Palma did not want to make the movie with him because he didn't think he was sympathetic, because we didn't want to destroy Michael's self-confidence. So we went back to the drawing boards. But a solution to their predicament was already in the works. Unbeknownst to the producers, someone had slipped a copy of their script to British director Adrian Lyne. I was in France, where I live. I live in the south of France. And so I get um, scripts sent there, and it's kind of easy to read them because uh, there's nothing else to do. And I started reading this sitting on the stairs outside my bedroom and was there an hour and a half later still reading, or rather finishing the screenplay. And I just thought it was a terrific page turner. Line, a former commercial director with two hit features, Flashdance and Nine and a Half Weeks under his belt, was on the lookout for his next project. He decided he'd found it in James Dearden's script. And I went uh, galloping through to my wife, who was, who was then in bed, and I said, I've got to do this, you know. And if I don't screw it up, it'll be huge. The material wasn't the only good fit. Line had spent some time developing Starman for producer Michael Douglas before the project ultimately went to John Carpenter, who ironically had been on the long list of directors who passed on Fatal Attraction. Douglas was ecstatic. You know, he's got a great eye, great style. You go back and look at Flashdance. He's a great sexuality uh, without it being uh, over the top. So I thought we were in really good hands. And this, this area of, of lust uh, is one that he, he savors uh, and enjoys. Line was equally excited to work with Douglas, seeing none of the problems with his casting that De Palma did. Walking in the room here, everybody would like him. Because he is, because he's, like, he's a nice guy. And he's sort of like every man, really. Though Douglas was in Line's corner, producer Stanley Jaffe had some reservations. I went to see Nine and a Half Weeks because a meeting was set up with him in New York. And I was very concerned because I wasn't sure he was an actor's director, in spite of the fact he's made some good movies. And I saw Nine and a Half Weeks and thought, this is a problem for me. It's a terrific movie, but it wasn't the kind of movie I thought we were going to be banking. Though impressed, Jaffe was taken aback by the tone of Line's smoldering film. So I went to his apartment to meet him the next day, and I said, this could be the shortest meeting in the history of this business. He said, what are you wanting? I said, A, I don't want the smoke alarm to go off in the theater, and B, we're not shooting a shoe commercial. And he laughed. He said, come on in. And we spent three hours talking, and he came on board. And Stanley called me up, and he said, Sherry, I wish you could have been in this meeting. 
And I said, why? He said, it was like talking to ourselves. Adrian understands this movie. He feels about it like we feel about it. And I, he said, he's perfect. As Flashdance was a big hit for Paramount, Lyon quickly gained the studio's vote of approval. Pre-production resumed, and Lyon's first task was to finalize casting. For Dan and Beth's best friends, Lyon hired actress and singer Ellen Foley and comedian Stuart Pankin. <laughs> That's my wife! I remember when I first went in to read for the movie, um, you know, they had me read the uh, the Glenn Close part, of course, with, with no intention of giving me the part, but he was really smart enough to see, give this person more room to spread out and then use our imagination in terms of maybe how we would cast them. And, and uh, so there's a generosity behind that. And uh, I, th I found he really cared about, about, about his actors. Stuart Bankin was huge value, I think. And I've always thought it's very interesting to, when you have any kind of um, ensemble piece or friend or whatever, I, I've used stand-up comics before because you get such a lot of extra stuff from them. I mean, he and Michael were, were fabulous together. <laughs> One of the first things that, uh, that Adrian did when we got there, I, I guess it was the first day, was before some early scene, is he sent us all out to lunch just to get to know each other. Now, we didn't become fast friends. But it broke the ice. I thought that was really smart. For the role of Dan's wife, Beth, the producers and Lyon shared a specific vision, and it came in the form of Ann Archer. Firstly, I thought it was interesting for him to be unfaithful to a really beautiful wife. Ann was perfect casting because what we didn't want was a husband who had a reason for cheating on his wife. He didn't want her to be villainous and, you know, the wife who was the bore or the difficult or the nagger or whatever that was. I thought that was interesting, that he wasn't going to something, you know, the obvious. And when you look at Ann Archer, she was perfect. She's beautiful inside and out. He wanted it to be a real struggle for the husband where, you know, audience was at go, what's wrong with this guy? You know, I really do think it's interesting, the arbitrary nature of infidelity, how there's no possible reason to do it, and yet people do the whole time without reason. Michael Douglas had no excuse for what he did, and that's what makes the movie so compelling and so interesting. For the role of Dan and Beth's daughter, hundreds of children were auditioned at an open call in Bedford, New York, where the second half of the film would be set. We'd never thought about acting or anything, and you know, I was just gonna be six around the time of the audition, and my mom said, hey, do you wanna try this? And I said, yeah, sure. So it was just sort of a for the hell of it kind of, of thing. So we showed up to the audition, and there were tons of little Jean Bidets running around, and their pretty dresses, and their makeup, and you know, here I was, this little tomboy with short hair and skin knees just coming from camp, and I didn't have a headshot, so they had to take a Polaroid. It came down to between her and a couple of professional kids, but the professional kids were too slick. They didn't have the natural quality that Adrian wanted, but Ellen did. And she was six, which is a pretty fabulous age, because when they're seven and eight, they go off, then they're less interesting, they become little people. You know what I'm saying? They become sort of more sophisticated, whereas at six, they're an innocent. It's a perfect age, really. Five, six is, is great. The newcomer was cast, despite her inexperience and short hair, which would affect at least one scene in the film. There was a scene in the original script where she's dropping me off, and she's supposed to cut off a, a braid. I didn't have a braid, so you know I had the short hair. In the end, she just gives me a little kiss, and I think that that was way more powerful. Through careful casting, Lyon began to build a believable, lived-in world in which his drama would unfold. But one crucial role remained, and it was a role that every woman in Hollywood either wanted desperately or wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. As Fatal Attraction filled its cast list and geared up for principal photography in the spring of 1986, one crucial piece of the puzzle was missing. Who would play the sexy, willful, and ultimately psychotic Alex Forrest? I feel you. Taste you. I think you. Okay. 
casting the role of Alex was extremely difficult. It was one of those impossible roles. She had to be everything. But I think the thing that was the most challenging and interesting was she had to be almost masculine in her power, but incredibly seductive so that we could believe that Michael's character would Inev you just would follow her anywhere and it would be okay. And we, of course, started very high end. We went after Deborah Winger, Barbara Hershey, who at the time was very desirable. Our first choice was actually Barbara Hershey, who wasn't available for the part. It seemed everybody in the 80s wanted Barbara Hershey. I think every movie we were casting, Barbara Hershey was like the number one choice. The casting department threw out a wide net and the role became one of the most sought after at the time. Every actress who was anybody wanted the part. I mean, everybody, it was a great role. At that point, it was called Sean. I know Amy Madigan gave great audition, and he met Gina Davis and Ellen Barkin, and just really good actors, but there was something missing for Adrian. Oddly, nearly as many actresses wanted nothing to do with the part. You gotta remember back in 86, 87, we were still on the end of the women's movement. Women, you know, did not want to play villains. It wasn't politically correct. A lot of people hated the script. I still remember, and I'm not going to say who it was, but this one actress who was very, very well known. We flew her in from Australia, came in to meet her, very distinguished woman, I mean, really quite an actress. And she said, I just came to see why anyone would want to make this horrible script. <laughs> so I said, you mean you let us fly you in first class so you could tell us that we were nuts? And I just thought that was kind of amazing that someone actually flew across country to tell me what an idiot I was. But I kind of never forgot that, I have to be honest with you. At the opposite end of the spectrum was Glenn Close, a three-time Oscar nominee who got her hands on the script through her agent, Fred Spector, and didn't want to let go. It was an amazing read for me. I remember distinctly the chair I was sitting in, and I read it without putting it down. And I think my, I was chilly when I came out of it. I think I'd been so concentrated that my temperature had actually lowered. And then one day, we got a call from Fred Spector. And he said, um, Glenn would, would like to do the part. It was a casting idea out of left field, and the production wanted to keep it there. I don't think we could ever say that Glenn was our first choice. Well, I think everybody was, including myself, were a little sort of reluctant because we knew that she was a terrific actress, but, you know, I'd seen Garp, where she played a nurse. I'd seen The Big Chill. And she gave no inclination. You had no idea that she could play this sort of a character. I wasn't aware of how much they didn't think I was right for the part. Um, I was very aware of the fact that the nature of the parts I played in Hollywood movies up to then had nothing to do with Alex Forrest. They just weren't interested. They felt like she was a character actress, she didn't have the sexuality, and they just kept saying no. And so I said to Fred Spector, look, please don't do this. Don't do this to yourself and don't do this to your client. Your client has just been nominated for an Academy Award. She's one of the greatest actresses in the entire world. But she's completely wrong for the part. This is not remotely what we're looking for. He accepted that, and he hung up. I couldn't get it out of my head. I, you know, it just kind of haunted me, and I started thinking, you know, to play this as a, as a, as a real human being, not just as, a, as kind of the evil person, you know, that that would be a, a great challenge. And I was very curious about her behavior. Day and a half later, Fred Spector calls me again. He says, I've been thinking about this. He said, I think you're wrong. He said, I think Glenn would be great. The production continued to put her off, but Close and her agent would not be ignored. I said, please, don't do this. Don't make us reject Glenn Close. She hasn't got a chance to get the part. And he said, well, Glenn's prepared for that. He said, Glenn is prepared to do whatever is necessary to prove to you that she is correct for the part. That is an actress. And that is somebody who knows something that I don't know. How do you not acknowledge that and at least take a meeting? So they finally agreed to go to a meeting. Casting director Risa Garcia became Close's first convert as she glimpsed the actress walking to the meeting in character. She was wearing a white suit, and something happened where the light hit her a certain way. I got chills, and I thought, oh my god, that's it she was pretty clear that she was gonna go in and, and seduce them, and they came out of there excited. Excited but not sold, 
The actress then made a bold request. She wants to come in and she wants to read. And all she asks is that you let her read with Michael Douglas. Well, of course, we weren't going to have Glenn Close read with the casting agent. Close's request threw the production for a loop. A three-time Oscar nominee asking to audition wasn't something they saw every day. And I said, there really isn't any way to get out of this. And so I called Fred Spector. I said, Fred, I just want to tell you something. Michael will read with her, will give her as much time as she needs, but this is such a long shot. I've never had an ego about auditioning because I think, especially in movies, the image you can potentially create in one character stays in people's minds. And they have to be convinced that you can do something else. It's going to go on and on and on until you face up to your responsibilities. What, respons what, what, what responsibilities are you talking about? I'm pregnant. What? I'm going to have your child. And you knew within less than two minutes that you had Alex and that you simply had found not only the best actress, she had transformed herself. She was the character. What am I supposed to do? You don't talk to me. You change your number. I'm not going to be ignored. The verdict was unanimous. Close didn't win the role. She took it. Because I won't let you treat me like some whore you can just bang. Just bang a couple of times, then dump in the trash can. The audition left no doubt, and she was officially cast shortly afterward. With its cast in place, the Fatal Attraction crew descended on New York to begin filming in the fall of 1986. Its next hurdle would be adjusting to a painfully exacting director whose methods would test the limits of both cast and crew. In the fall of 1986, Fatal Attraction was set to begin filming. After weathering studio resistance, a change of director, and an exhaustive search to find the film's complex leading lady, the team was eager to get started, but new obstacles lay ahead. The whole movie was done on live location. We didn't have any sets on that film. Adrian liked the authenticity of everything and wanted everything real. Adrian hated sets. Everything had to be live, and it made it a little more difficult because the walls didn't come out and stuff didn't move. When you're in the studio, half the time you're thinking, oh, God, shall I float this wall? Because if I float it, it's 20 minutes to take it out, 20 minutes to put it back in, and all of those sort of questions. And so all, all of a sudden, you don't have those worries. Freed from studio confines, Line used the Manhattan backdrop to provide a vivid canvas for his story. There is something palpably interesting and, and exciting about shooting in New York. When you're in New York City, there's gum that squash into the street, and you have those black spots and so forth. It's little details like that that make something work. And that's what New York offers. And the people are interesting. They're just going to the street, and they're interesting. There was a sexiness to this movie, and it borrowed from the sexiness of New York. And there's nothing like the energy and the creative energy and how people feel when they're, uh, they're here. Perhaps the most distinctive location in the film is Alex Forrest Loft, located in the meatpacking district of Manhattan. Getting it on film wasn't easy. I think he looked at 267 lofts, to give you an idea, some of which I didn't attend with him. He would not settle. It had to be, it ultimately had to be a loft overlooking the meat market. I love the fact that you could look out of the window and, that, and it was there, you know, that, that was where she lived. And having that, that sense of environment and, and, uh, and neighborhood around him. So he never settled. Lyons' exacting demands resulted in an unexpected amount of filming locations. Adrian needed a different exterior. He needed a different staircase. He needed a different doorway. He needed a different interior. He wanted everything to be perfect. So that one location ended up being five locations. And that's the way the whole movie was. It was treat treated in a way as a, uh, as a set, but it was still a real location, and I, th I think that's important. Line wanted his locations to provide an earthy, lived-in quality, which he felt was impossible to achieve in a studio setting. The meat packing district now is very, very fancy. It wasn't like that when we shot the movie. There's a lot of blood running in the streets, and there's a lot of smell. It's about that elevator. 
having sex in a big, empty metal box, you know, with a door that slams shut, and you're probably smelling all that blood and guts coming from the street. <laughs> Though the New York City locations provided Lyon with a hefty dose of realism, the cramped quarters came with no shortage of challenges. You knew what Adrian wanted visually. He didn't make it easy to get it sometimes with the locations he chose. Getting equipment in and out was always a problem. And a static camera was almost a necessity at times. There are some moves, though, you know, where uh, you want to underscore something, but they're very short. Uh, very quiet moves and not any long dolly tracks and very little diagonal or across the frame moves because the walls were right on top of us. For the actors, however, the tight working spaces offered some advantages as well. Because of the closeness of the apartment, it wasn't really possible for that many people to be in the rooms at one time, so it actually gave you a, um, a more of an intimacy. Adrian would put you in tight little locations like that apartment that some, maybe some directors would say, this is just too tight, but he liked that, and I think we all appreciated it. I don't know how the crew felt. I know the actors loved it. <laughs> Being crammed into the tight spaces created a bond between director and cast. And I remember it was, it was a pleasure to have Adrian kind of right there as, as part of the team. And you, you, you wanted to make him feel proud. He was like part of it. And when we were actually filming, Adrian talked a lot during the takes. And I'm also a little bit like a sort of a demented cheerleader. I sort of, if I see something I like, uh, like that looks good or looks erotic or whatever, I say, do it again, do it again, do it, you know, you know scream at them. <laughs> Hotter, hotter, hotter. Well, I gave you a <laughs> I've never had a director do that before, and it was really kind of fun. He was really into it. And, and you know, unlike uh, a lot of directors who now just exist up behind the monitor, you felt like Adrian was somebody who was down there in the trenches with you. Line's participatory style of directing helped the actors create one of the film's most memorable scenes. Are you? Yeah, my wife. Discreet. Yes, I'm discreet. Me too. And I remember Adrian, <laughs> Adrian telling me when it was Michael's close up to actually say really racy things to him. <laughs> you know, to get kind of a spontaneous reaction from him. At one point, I, I, I asked um, Glenn to play footsie with him underneath the table without telling Michael that she was going to do that. And the effect on his face was lovely because he was unprepared for it. Does that make you feel good? Does it make me feel bad? <laughs> it worked. That was one of the early scenes that I shot with Michael. So we really, when I first met him, I was very intimidated by him. I mean, he was like Mr. Hollywood. You know, he was very suave. And I was just, I thought of myself as a working stage actress still, really, you know. And um, I just, we came from two very different worlds within, you know, the same profession. And he kept telling these jokes that I just didn't get. <laughs> And then when we started working together, it was it was wonderful. It's not him and it's not her. It's what happens when they're together, really. It's the chemistry of the two. You can have two wonderful actors who just don't mesh. And they did wonderfully. The main part of a film is the performance between two, three people. That's all that matters. If you've got a good story and good actors and a good director, you've got a good film. You could put them in a box. That's it. And that's one of the, um, the beauties of being a cameraman or a film technician. I sat two feet away from some of the most powerful performances um, in cinema history, really. And it's just, just a real privilege to do it. Though the film's performances seem to benefit from Line's methods, winning over the crew, and especially producer Stanley Jaffe, would be another battle. Cameras were rolling on the set of Fatal Attraction, where director Adrian Lyons' unconventional shooting style 
took both cast and crew by surprise. You'd spend the morning kind of fumbling around, and he would be like wasting time, kind of like, what are we doing here, you know? We worked a lot of long hours. He would spend two hours almost every day putting a camera here, moving it five inches, putting a lens here, changing a lens, until he got comfortable. Once he got comfortable, he could move quickly, but it took him a long time. I'm sort of hideously undisciplined, and I turn up not knowing what the f I'm going to do, you know. But I always do a shot list at 5 or 6 in the morning, and on the left-hand page of my script, I have ideas for the scene. I have visual ideas, you know, that I've taken out of magazines, stuff like that. I become enraged when, you know, I look at the set and I don't believe, you know, I don't believe that somebody lives in it. Adrian's reputation is, is that he's a bit chaotic on the set. He had um, almost an unconscious knowledge of everything he wanted to do on the set. He might not be able to explain it. So your day kind of goes kind of slow, slow, and he's kind of looking around and trying to figure it out. And then, boom, the afternoon is, is an intense rush of, of, of filming. Line's obsessive eye for detail inspired a fair amount of small and large-scale scrambling on the part of the crew. The first day of shooting, we're shooting down on Wall Street. He asked for a briefcase, and I gave him a briefcase, and he hated it. He said it was too new. And I says, well, you know, I don't even, I says, well, I go to the truck and get some more stuff. He says, I don't have time. And I says, so, well, you know, why didn't you tell me ahead of time what you wanted? And was some, and I says, what do you want? I says, here, see all these guys walking down the street? Pick out a briefcase. He says, I like that one. Some guy walking down the street. And I went over to the guy and said, I'll buy you a briefcase. He says, I don't want to sell it. I said, I'll give you 300. And he looked at me and says, you give me $300 for this briefcase? I said, yeah. I says, not only that, I'll give you another one to carry your stealth in. So he said, OK, gave him 300 bucks. He gave me the briefcase. I gave it to the, the actor, and Adrian was happy. But not all of Lyne's wishes were so easily solved, sometimes testing the patience of producer Stanley Jaffe. I mean, there were times I wanted to kill him. I mean, there's no question about that. The producer has to worry about the budget. The artist really shouldn't. And the producer sometimes has to say, you know, we've done eight takes. We have it. We have to move on. We'd have furious fights, furious. So I'm all for that up to a point, as long as you don't sort of come to blows. We had this car all picked out, and I took pictures of this car, and I showed him the pictures of the car, and he okayed it. He says, yeah, that's fine. So the day we were supposed to shoot it, you know, I bring the car up, and he looks at the car, and he says, I hate it. Yeah, I always take all of the color out. I always make it out of black or white or beige. So it's pretty much monochromatic, and I've done that in every film I've done, really. And so somebody turned up. For some reason, Michael's car was blue. I said, well, I'm not using that. Stanley comes running over, and he, and he comes over to me. He says, what's the matter? He says, he doesn't like the car. Well, didn't he see it before? I said, yeah, I started to show him pictures of the car and everything. I said, he picked it out, he okayed it, he liked it. And Stanley went bonkers with him. I said, you get the camera out of here and let's shoot the scene, please. And I remember having a massive fight with uh, Stanley, um, you know, because essentially he thought I should just get on with it and use the blue car, but I'm a, I'm a, that sort of thing, I'm a maniacal about it. We had some pretty good to-dos on the picture, but it was always about the movie, it was never personal. And quite often, you know, when you're fighting like that, um, and it's all about the script or about what's good for the film, um, is that something better than either of you thought of comes out of the, the argument. Though a bane to his producers, Lyne's indulgences were a boon to some. And I remember we did a dance scene, like on a script, it's like a dance scene. It'll be an eighth of a page in the script, and you get three days' worth of dailies. <laughs> we used to judge how much footage you have by the rack space on how you stored film. Right. <laughs> And on some features, you'd have a three-racker. And on this show, we had like over eight racks of film, yeah. which is probably more than 700,000 feet of film. Oh, easily. Yeah. You know, it yeah. was close to a million feet of film, right. probably. Right. It's a gold mine. It's a gold mine. For an editor, it's a gold yeah. mine. What uh, footage, you what choices. Yeah. Policing these excesses once again fell to producer Jaffe. Adrian would print everything. You know, we had a budget that said you'd print 70%. He printed 100%. I said, Adrian, you asked for the cameras to roll. He coughed, you call, cut. What do you think you're gonna get? 
because he feels everything very strongly, so he gets nervous when we're when we're behind or whatever. And I, I, and I was, which is fairly often with me, um, so I always feel for him, you know, because he's suffering more than more than I am. But but he's he's very very passionate, and so is Sherry. I mean, they're both great to work with because because they feel so strongly. I mean, they're real producers. They're real producers, and there aren't, and there aren't many now. Line came up with creative ways to put his producers at ease. I never go beyond 10 takes. I mean, I do, but I get the, the, the guy who putting the clapperboard out, I get him to call it 9A. So it's 9A take one, but it's really take 11. They get panicked if they say 11, see 11, 12, 13, 14, or whatever. Yeah, now I'm guys. screwed. <laughs> Adrian, I'm telling you, is a gift to a producer, and he's also but the gift is worth that. The long days would end in the Gulf and Western building, where dailies would be screened for an exhausted crew. We used to go up there and they had these lovely big leather, um, you know, half shell shaped chairs. And I think we used to go and sleep. Because <laughs> every now and again you'd wake up and someone was saying, oh, that's it. And you'd all get up and pretend you'd watched, but I think most people had actually dozed off because they were very long days. But producer Stanley Jaffe was watching as Line's skill as a director was revealing itself in the footage. It's really strange. I feel like I know you already. I just want to know where I stand. What I didn't know about Adrian, he's got one of the great ears for truth. I think you're terrific. From an actor that I've ever worked with. But I'm married. He really tried to make it as an eavesdropper. He wanted that camera not to be intrusive, and he also didn't want to bring attention to the camera. I hate the process of, of, of filming. I hate the clapper board that, that frightens everybody. I hate the red light. I, I hate somebody screaming for silence. So I, so I try and make it as much as possible like you're not doing it. So that I put the clapper board on at the end a lot um, so that you're not frightening the act. I, I get frightened. You get a bang, oh God, we're doing it again. And now it's a, it's a mini drama every time you do a take. And so I try and avoid that. You know, I try and avoid saying action, to be honest. I mean, he, he was the chef. You know, we gave him the ingredients and he really was the chef and he did a fabulous job with it. But it would take all lines, ingredients and a fair amount of tequila to help his actors successfully navigate the film's explicit sex scenes. The ship was... In the fall of 1986, the New York-based film crew of Fatal Attraction was learning how to work within director Adrian Lyne's exacting style. As the film approached its crucial sex scenes, Lyne was struggling. It was on a Monday morning and the call sheet said, bedroom. And so the whole crew came up for rehearsal uh, to the bedroom in the loft. And Adrian and the cameraman are in the kitchen, and they're talking. And I said to the AD, I says, where are we shooting this morning? He says, in the bedroom. So I said, why are they in the kitchen? He says, I don't know. The set dressers had worked for hours, you know, probably since, you know, 5 a.m. to prep the bedrooms. 15 minutes later, they're still in the kitchen. I go back to the AD and said, what's going on? He kept putting off filming that scene, Adrian, because he didn't have an inspiration about how he should shoot it. Even Adrian didn't know how that scene was going to pan out. It was just an idea he'd come up with the night before, I think. That went on for 45 minutes, and finally Adrian came over to me and he says, does the water work in the sink? So I said, yeah. You know, you just got to be on your toes all the time. So I hooked up the hoses, turned on the water, he looked at it, and he said, it's not coming out fast enough. I really think this was a last minute, you know, thing of Adrian's. I said, well, maybe Adrian, now it might be a really good time for you to tell us what's going on. He says, well, this is where we're shooting the scene. Didn't anybody tell you? I says, no, Adrian. I said, who did you tell? Because nobody else around here knows. And he looked at me and he says, maybe I didn't tell anybody. And so we were all pretty surprised when Adrian called out in his voice, uh, you know, this way, this way, everybody, you know, in his lovely English accent. Well, here's where we'll be. She'll be here, he'll be there. And we're like, this is the kitchen, Adrian. <laughs> uh, he said, I know, darling, it'll be lovely. I'm always very wary of 
of, you know, just people diving into bed, you know. And I, I love the spontaneity of the sink, you know. It's much, much more fun, you know, less expected. At that point, what we knew about Adrian was to kind of be ready for anything. Once the crew was up to speed, it was up to Lai, his actors, and his cameraman to bring the scene to life. We knew that there would be a good deal of handheld work in Fatal Attraction uh, at particular moments. I've always thought you shouldn't impose a style on a movie. I've always thought that the style should come out of the scene. In other words, if the, if, if the scene is frenetic, so the camera work should be frenetic. The sense of when to use handheld was really a, an intuitive decision. You know, um, it's something that we not even speak about. The drama of the scene should be magnified by your camera work. Line and camera operator Craig Hagenson worked out the blocking, while Douglas and Close charted new cinematic territory on top of the kitchen sink. We loved it because it was so kind of uh, spontaneous and unchoreographed and kind of messy and funny at the same time. When I saw the love scenes, I thought, that's fresh. You know, I, th I thought that that was, you know, I thought that it was erotic. It really looked, looked, looked it was rabid. I mean, it really looked like they were going at it. You know, it was terrific. I was pleased about it, really. Oh, I was great. Oh, thank God. Line had a knack for making not only his actors comfortable, but the audience as well. You also have to be careful that you don't get into this sort of soft porn area. You know, I think you have to have humor. I think the people are so nervous watching people having sex that they're inclined to, to titter. You know, they're nervous, so they laugh. And so I sort of came up with the idea when I was holding her making love, but I had my pants down on my ankles and, and, and sort of waddling to the bed, you know, trying to figure out what to do, that we got a laugh there, which allows the audience to kind of uh, uh, have an, uh, an emotional release, you know, and they can kind of laugh a little bit and they're more relaxed. By the time the production got to the second sex scene, the cast and crew had become comfortable enough with each other to have some fun. We have um, a scene in an, in an elevator. And uh, Tommy Sachi was there, you know, working the elevator, and I was so embarrassed. Tommy was my first prop guy in the world, according to Garp, and it was like having to do something, you know, kind of risky and it makes me shy in front of somebody that I know. And she looked at me and she said, you're going to be in here for this scene? And I said, Tommy, I, I don't know, you know, I don't know if I can do this to you here. And he said, Glenn, it's either me or him. <laughs> and he looked over and there was the, the re real guy, you know, who worked the elevator. And I looked, took one like I said, OK, <laughs> OK, Tommy, it'll be you. She says, don't look at me. I says, I won't. <laughs> And I said, all I want is a pitcher of margaritas. And um, kind of half joking, but not totally joking. And uh, when we came back to shoot it there, Tommy handed me a pitcher full of margaritas, and I, I probably drank about half of it. <laughs> With his leading lady now fortified against her natural inhibitions, Line dared close to push the boundaries even further. Little to my knowledge, Adrian wound up Glenn about you know, I bet you wouldn't ever do that. Well, we talked about it, and I knew that I wanted to be, you know, hot and very sexy. And normally, the director stands, you know, by the camera, so the day before by the camera. So he started seeing, and Adrian was over here. He was over here. No, nobody ever did, did anything, but but um, we should talk about this afterwards, will you? <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't figure out what he was doing and then I figured out I found out later what their little their little game their little game was uh, what it was but he was going to try to find out whether she was actually going to do it or not <laughs> can't put this in this is salacious she killed me we were all all professionals it was... I think Michael and Glenn were so extraordinarily brave with each other and that's that's all you can wish for as a, as a director the casting of both Douglas and Close was proving to be a master stroke, and their chemistry carried over into their final scenes together. Just after he's taken the knife off her, and there's a kind of a standoff between them. And they're breathing hard, you know, like this. And then she starts to smile. 
and it's so bizarre. And, and I love the idea because I, I, I think that they were within an ace of, of going, you know what I'm saying? Fight sequences and sex scenes are very similar. There's so much tension, so much sort of sexual tension as well, I think, that I love the sort of insanity of that. And with the shoot nearing another signature moment, the insanity was about to come to a boil. I'm As production on Fatal Attraction continued, cast and crew successfully tackled each obstacle as it came, expertly navigating the film's explicit sensuality, as well as the film's weightier emotional moments. I think you're terrific. But I'm married. Of equal concern to the creative team was keeping the audience on board with an unfaithful leading man. This largely came down to the casting of Michael Douglas, the very issue over which director Brian De Palma left the project. I don't want to lose my family. What always amazed me about Michael from the very, very beginning when we were working on the script all the way through to the end of the movie is he cared more about the movie than he did about his part. And he knew that if the movie was good, that was the best thing that could happen to him. He worked really hard for Glenn, for example, off camera. He screamed himself hoarse. What responsibilities? In fights, when she was doing her part first. He was incredibly giving. And if you look at his films, you'll see that some of the best performances by women are giving, given in Michael Douglas's quote, starring films. I wanted something that suggested that maybe the relationship between Michael and Glenn Close could, could have been a love story, a real love story, rather than a sexual story. And I was looking for this moment, just wanted a, and I didn't know what it was, and it was Michael who thought of that, you know, he was eating a bagel with cream cheese, and I said, what about if I get it, get it on my nose, you know? And she points it out and says, put it on, on your nose. And, and it's an endearing moment, a sweet moment, rather than a sexual moment. It was terrific. But when he's uh, not in front of the camera in his character, he's uh, on the other side uh, working to make the scene better. And there's one particular scene where um, Alex has cut her wrists. <laughs> oh, she... He rushes in to get some, some bandages from the bathroom. Well, we had a camera set up at a very low angle, and, and Mike was to run in from the side. He came over and he said, Craig, will you see this column? as you pass by, you know. <laughs> But if you watch that shot where the camera races by, he uses that post to put his hand on and help him go around the corner, you would think. But it's really to keep that bloody uh, print in the frame. After nearly two decades in front of the camera, Dan Gallagher turned out to be a pivotal role for Douglas. It was a real breakthrough for me as an actor, because as we were preparing for it, you know, and I was studying, working on my character, there was a moment when he said, wait a minute, I could be a lawyer. I, I mean, I'm Dan Gallagher. I could be a lawyer in New York. I could be married here. And what it did for me is allowed me to wipe the makeup off and get down to moment to moment because this could be you. Countering Douglas's portrayal was Glenn Close's full-blooded performance as Alex Forrest. At that time, there was really no talk about how Alex Forrest might be mentally unbalanced in some way. She might be suffering from some sort of mental disorder. I went to two different psychiatrists. The conclusion was that her behavior... I'm not trying to hurt you, Dan. I love you. You what? I love you. ...was that of someone who had been incested very early on, almost pre-memory, for enough time to really, really make her incredibly self-destructive and unable to have a balanced adult relationship. Close gave her character a somewhat surprising level of sympathy. There's a moment when she, she says she's got tickets for the opera. I'd really love it if you'd come with me, kind of as a peace offering. And finally, at the end of the, of the scene, he gives her a hug. And he doesn't see, the audience sees, but he doesn't see this face of utter desolation.
just heartbroken Bye. that he won't come with her. It's not just playing a black and white evil character. I mean, even though a lot of people perceive her as being evil, I never did. She was basically in need of help. I just want to be a part of your life. Oh, this is the way you do it, huh? Showing up at my apartment? Well, what am I supposed to do? You won't answer my calls, you change your number. I mean, I'm not going to be ignored, Dan. That was a line that I thought really resonated for women. And so I loved the Glenn Close character. I didn't think she was a monster, um, and she isn't. And Glenn felt exactly the same way. I felt that she was a career woman, very vulnerable, and this was one married man too many, and that she had gone over the edge. And I felt it was a complicated character. The signature scene came to define the character, but gave the actress a surprising amount of difficulty at the time. I think it's because of what I was wearing. I was wearing this little teddy, and I'm not used to wearing stuff like that. So I think I was actually feeling really exposed and really vulnerable. Actually, exactly what the character was feeling. And it came out of a very difficult process for me. I'm gonna be the mother of your child. I want a little respect. There were equally challenging scenes on the other side of the triangle. Honey, we gotta talk. In one, Dan confesses to his wife, Beth. Do you have an affair with her? Yes. And she starts to cry, and she says, do you love her? Are you in love with her? And I, look, I tear up even thinking about it because it's such a vulnerable moment. And he says, no, no, I never loved her. We just kept shooting that end moment. And um, we just had to lift it. What is the matter with you? <laughs> Finally, out of me came the thing that was probably deepest in my heart about it. I mean, why would a guy do this? What is the matter with you? That's a scene that everybody, any, any couple, um, can I identify with, or, or that's their nightmare, you know, that's their nightmare. And in the background, the little girl is standing there, their little daughter, and she looks so confused, and she's holding this little doll. I don't want to hear it! I don't want to hear it! And it's such a real moment. My direction was to basically come to my mark, which was in a doorway, and to stand on the mark and not say anything. And so that's what I did, and, and I had my unicorn here, my little uni. Unlike her more seasoned co-stars, the young novice didn't have the same acting tools to build an emotional moment, so the crew needed to get creative. And I'm standing there, and all of a sudden, Michael kind of turns his attention to me and says, what are you looking at? I think I, think I said that. I also think I said, I think I'm going to take it. I, I said, you don't need uni anymore. I said, I'm going to take it away. And so he just kind of starts to get me, and he said, oh, you know, look at you and your stupid unicorn. I'm going to take that unicorn. I'm going to throw it in the garbage. I'm going to take that unicorn. I'm going to give it to somebody who really needs it. <laughs> and I just kind of melt into her at one point and cry. And, you know, I think that they finally got the desired effect, and then they, Adrian said, cut. And all of a sudden, Michael's demeanor completely changed. And, you know, he ran to me and held me and said, I'm so sorry. I'm not how do you think for the movie, right? <laughs> Perhaps most etched into crew members' memories is the discovery of the Gallagher's pet rabbit, boiled alive by Alex. I bought three, uh, three white, white rabbits before they were gutted or anything. I just got them whole. And they shot it for hours and hours. And that rabbit was in that pot for hours while they did it, boiling water. Adrian yells action. And just as she's about to lift the lid on the pot, the rabbit blows up, explodes, and throws rabbit all over the kitchen, ceiling everywhere. And it was awful stench. It just stunk the whole house up just, I mean, the, cleared the whole house out. And that's when they broke for lunch, <laughs> because of the smell. It was a real horrible experience. And uh, I think after that, they used only gutted rabbits. 
And as the film headed towards its finale and unforgiving preview audiences, things were about to turn even more explosive. You all think. After nearly seven years of development, rejection, and false starts, Fatal Attraction was on track. Mom. And its cast and crew were seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. The crew ready to shoot the film's finale, in which Alex Forrest takes her own life following a violent confrontation with Dan Gallagher. She's dead. And Dan is wrongly jailed for her death. It was an ending that troubled the production, even at the earliest scripting stages. My first draft, I seem to remember, ended with Michael literally in the electric chair. I mean, it was a kind of like the final image was him strapped to, you know, old Sparky. At that time in my life, I absolutely loved it, you know, that your actions, you know, have consequences, that, you know, you get punished for what you do. But Stanley and Michael always hated that ending. Months earlier, in an effort to strengthen the finale, producer Stanley Jaffe turned to colleague Nicholas Meyer, a writer, director, and novelist who also had a production deal at Paramount. Meyer found the script's ending too bleak and offered a suggestion. The philandering husband got a punishment that seemed out of proportion to his crime. Certain kind of movies that I think of as like whew, movies. What we needed was a close call and I went to work on this script. He had an incredible idea for an ending, which is that is when Michael Douglas is being carted off to jail, Ann Archer, his wife, goes upstairs and finds the tape that Glenn Close had sent to Michael where she threatens to kill herself. And so you know that Michael's gonna get off. I'll just go deeper next time. I'll kill myself, I will. And this was the ending that everybody loved, and this was the ending that was shot. We went to do what are called previews, where you put it up in front of an audience, and the audience is supposed to tell you they love it. That's what you're hoping for. And we were very excited. As the film unspooled, their hard work seemed to be validated, as did some of their tougher decisions. On the very, very first screening of the movie, Michael Douglas, who has cheated on his wonderful wife, Ann Archer, for absolutely no reason, comes home, jumps in to his bed, and messes it up. So it looks like he's been sleeping in it all weekend when in fact he hasn't been there. And the audience applauded. And I remember Sherry turns, I said, I can't believe this. Like they, they've forgiven you already. That's how sympathetic Michael Douglas is. That's how much they loved his character. So, yes, I guess inherently every actor has their strengths and their weaknesses or their qualities, and, and uh, in my case, I get forgiven <laughs> a lot. For producer Sherry Lansing and Stanley Jaffe, it was a moment that confirmed their decision to back Douglas over director Brian De Palma. Brian De Palma called me, and he said, you were right. I owe you an apology. Michael is so sympathetic and so brilliant. And bravo and congratulations. And that's a class act. Preview audiences were enthralled as they watched Dan Gallagher's disastrous affair and the nightmarish chain of events it sets off. The audience was absolutely riveted to the screen. And um, it's one of those rare things where you're, you're sitting as a studio executive in a first showing of a film where you say, I don't think it'd go much better than this. But as the film's bleak, tragic ending played out, a palpable shift occurred in the audience. I didn't do it. In that case, all we have to do is check your fingerprints against the murder weapon. I'm sorry, your husband's under arrest. And it crashed. You could hear moans in the audience when they had the Madame Butterfly, as we call it, ending. And the audience was not satisfied that ultimately this was going to be the ending, that she was going to win, ultimately. Reaching out of the grave as she took her own life set me up, and there wasn't an emotional, cathartic finish. But I remember when Michael Douglas saw the movie, he said, the end doesn't work. And I thought, he's wrong. When I saw it on the screen, I said, you know, I know the answer is, but it doesn't work. You're left frustrated. When I read the script, when I worked on the script, it was very clear to me that you could look at Alex Forrest in one of two ways. She was either the neurotic victim 
of a predatory guy, or she was a sociopathic creature. When the movie was finished, that dichotomy didn't exist anymore. You just wanted to see her die. And at every single screening, when Ann Archer picked up the phone this is Beth and said to Glenn Close, If you ever come near my family again, I'll kill you, you understand? The audience applauded. So we had a conversation with, with uh, Sherry and uh, Stanley and Adrian in front of the concession stand in the theater to talk about. And it was pretty easy, pretty easy to say what's wrong here. And he said to me, Sherry, the audience wants Ann Archer to kill Glenn Close. And I looked at him like he was crazy. I said, what? I mean, kill? I mean, what are you talking about? He said, that's what they want. Stanley came up to me and I said, you know what Frank Mancuso just said? He said, yeah, you have to think about that. You have to see what the audience is saying to you. You have to listen. Screenwriter James Dearden was flown back to Los Angeles to draft a new conclusion for the film. Given that it was my original project, I was, you know, I felt pretty protective of it. And it was quite a strange experience to have to rewrite the ending. A new ending was a tough sell for Dearden and Lansing. For Glenn Close, it was inconceivable. My initial reaction was that they were joking. And she looked at us. <laughs> And I remember she looked at Adrian and she looked at me and she said, you gotta be kidding. I mean, she, she thought we were nuts with what we were offering. And then I got really angry because for me, it was kind of a profound problem. Dearden reinvented the film's climax as a harrowing home invasion in which Alex menaces Beth in the bathroom. Anytime you have a movie where the uh, big climax, a uh, big action knife scene takes place in a shower, more or less, you're really hearkening back to Psycho. This is placing it definitely in that timeline. Once you put a knife like that in somebody's hand, <laughs> the image is much stronger than any kind of intellectual idea. So I was kind of talking Glenn through the ending, and she had this baseball cap on that was pulled over her eyes, and I actually saw her eyes tearing up, and she said, and then, they blow her away, and I went, yes. And she went to Stanley, you can take me to Bedford in a straitjacket, but you can't make me do it. I'd really committed to the character, and I thought it was betraying her to make her into a psychopath. Her real worry was that she didn't want to be like a, a knife-wielding psycho, you know, just the, the sort of, the conventional sort of idea of what, of what that would be like. Close demanded that the new ending remain true to the character she'd worked so hard to create. To Glenn's credit, she went and talked to a psychiatrist or a couple and found out that this would have been equally valid as an, a resolution to her life. And so she was willing to do it. She really challenged herself to try and find it. And, and it wasn't easy because she, she was in disagreement. We were all in disagreement. I tried desperately to remind the audience that she was a, a character in, in, uh, in terrible pain. And so gouging my leg, it ends up being a brilliant scene. I mean, that's one of the most terrifying scenes, I think, in movies, when she shows up in the bathroom, not even knowing what she was doing. And I was trying to maintain that self-destructive quality. And if she didn't even realize what she was doing, if she didn't realize the significance and the awfulness of cutting herself in that way, that would make the scene that much more exciting and horrifying and, and dangerous than if she wasn't doing it. So then I became very excited by uh, the possibilities of the ending because it was something that you hadn't seen before. The new climax meant one last violent face-off between Dan and Alex. Close found the scene challenging in more ways than one. It was brutal. I mean, she had to go back into that bathtub any number of times, and you couldn't put anything up her nose to stop the water from going down. So when she was through, she had a really bad sinus infection. But she's a trooper. When you watch the film, she's fully there. There's no question she's not phoning it in because she's not happy with the new ending. She's really giving it her all. I mean, you're so stupid. You're just so stupid. You're stupid. Stupid. 
for the film's final jump scare, Line harkened back to a macabre classic of French cinema, Les Diaboliques. Adrian came up with, you know, a gangbuster of, a, of an ending, stealing a little bit from a couple of other films, but uh, executing it uh, really well. And it was the kind of ending that the audience wanted and uh, felt rewarded enough in terms of how much tension we'd built up to that point. Ultimately, Glenn Close made peace with the new ending. That's what people want, and it's kind of classic with Greeks and with Shakespeare. You have order, order's disrupted, some element comes in, blood is shed, and order is restored. Blood is the fastest way to get to order. So that's what happened. Um, they gave the audience my blood. And, and what it did was create catharsis for them, to create hope for them as the camera comes into that little family at the end, that order will be restored and they could feel better about themselves. With the new finale in the can, the film was readied for release. What came next surprised everyone involved. Seven years after producers Sherry Lansing and Stanley Jaffe optioned the British short film Diversion, Fatal Attraction wrapped in mid-1987. Studio rejections, casting dilemmas, and a controversial change to the film's ending were all behind them. Two, the film was released on September 18, 1987. Despite the passion and perseverance, according to director Adrian Lyne, studio expectations were low. They didn't think they'd make money with Fatal Attraction. The conventional wisdom then was that thrillers don't make money. The film opened to mixed reviews. Adding to the studio's concerns was a growing controversy over what some viewed as a negative portrayal of the 80s career woman. I think part of the reason the film came under fire was because the, that sentiment seemed to permeate the story of the film about a career woman who is so desperate for companionship that she's essentially willing to kill for it. And is the film anti-feminism? Um, is it pro-feminism? She's a very strong female character, yet she's insane or, you know, very sick. Some people see it as misogynistic, um, but, you know, one of the producers was a female, and, and her feeling was is that we've all done obsessive things. You know, there were enraged feminists uh, afterwards, you know, saying this was a, an assault on the career woman and garbage like that. It was just so silly. Far from hurting the film, the controversy played into a growing national conversation as the film became a word-of-mouth hit and a full-fledged phenomenon. There was roundly circulated stories about women and girlfriends taking their husbands and boyfriends to see this film. It became part of the social fabric of the country and how people talked about it and couldn't stop talking about it. It's just a hot subject. Pushes everybody's buttons. Pushes the button of a guy uh, cheating on his wife and all the questions that arise from that. A lot of men who I knew were married came up to me and out of earshot of their wife, they would say, well, thanks a lot. You've screwed it for us. You know, you've screwed it for, for married men, essentially. Um, I remember that. I think this anger had built up between men and women that had never been expressed. Very elemental. And I think that movie uncapped the anger. And I know that it got a lot of people to their psychiatrist's couch because the, uh, the American Association of Psychiatrists told me so. And it's fun when, when it becomes sort of a phenomenon, you know, when it comes, you know, when Michael and Glenn are on the, on the front of Time magazine, you know, that, that, that's wonderful. When the smoke cleared, no one could deny that the new finale helped stick the landing and turned fatal attraction into a household phrase. I don't think it would have happened uh, to that extent without the change uh, in the ending. The ending they went with is pure cinema. Uh, I think the original ending might be a little bit smarter and a little bit darker and a little bit more interesting, but the, the, the ending that is on the film is so cinematic, it's so exciting, it's so visceral, and it's the kind of ending that audiences demand, basically, at the end of the day. It's the kind of ending where you can stand up and cheer uh, because Ann Archer walks in that bathroom and finally kills the monster. Uh, it's, it's, it's redemptive for everybody involved.
Others were troubled by how audiences interpreted the final shot of the film, a reaction which the filmmakers claim missed the point. The audience cheered, and we were all, again, a bit shocked that they were going to cheer this, um, you know, fairly brutal blowing away of poor old Glenn Close, you know, and then you cut to the scene where the cops are leaving and they're shaking by the hand, and Glenn's still, you know, being scraped off the tiles in the bathroom. And I certainly didn't think the detective was congratulating him on a job well done. And I saw it as kind of slightly ironic. You pan down the corridor and end up on this picture of the family in happier times, and I thought that was a kind of ironic postscript to the movie. The movie eventually became the second highest grossing film of 1987. This was one of those films where, you know, the stars aligned in a way that you could never have predicted before. If the film's financial success was a surprise, awards season was a complete shock to the filmmakers, as Fatal Attraction garnered six Oscar nominations. The scream that morning, I'm sure they heard in other states. I was so excited, and I said to Frank Mancuso, I said, this is a once-in-a-lifetime experience to be nominated for all these Academy Awards. And he said, not in everybody's lifetime. And that's a very good lesson to remember. We did not win one Academy Award, and I still tell you, it was one of the happiest nights of my entire life. In fact, the only member of the team who won that night was Michael Douglas recipient of the Best Actor Oscar for Wall Street. It was a breakout year for the star. The fact that you feel now that you can broaden your horizons as an actor. Fatal Attraction was a huge hit, and getting the Oscar on Wall Street, all, both in this, that same year, changed my life, you know, as an actor. Um, and I finally got to that level uh, as an actor and felt like I'd sort of stepped out of the shadow of my, my father. The film's success also signaled a new chapter in the career of its leading lady. What really I think she took away from it was the strength. She is never a secondary character in anything that she does. She's always a strong center for everything that she's done ever since then, all the way up till now with the, the show Damages, where she is this smart, conniving center of the story. Fatal Attraction redefined a genre for over a decade. While it drew from psychological thriller things and from slasher movie things, it was the confluence of these things with the erotic element that just sort of created its own crazy genre that barreled on for the decade to come, uh, the erotic thriller. I think it just, it hit that right note, was executed well, and has been copied ever since. In fact, Fatal Attraction gave rise to a tidal wave of homages, imitations, and copycats practically creating its own subgenre, but none achieved the status of the original. It is just so much fun when a story like that brings the whole world a little closer. I mean, adultery exists worldwide, and you know, to see how that picture played, uh, to me, is one of, the, one of the great magics about making movies. And it continues to resonate as screenwriter James Dearden prepares a version of his screenplay for the London stage. It was a way for me also to kind of go back to my original you know, ending, and, and I don't want to give too much away, but it has got the original ending, uh, and, and, and slightly more to the character as I'd originally conceived, uh, 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 as less of a kind of harridan and less of a, of a psychopath. I think this film will resonate with audiences of every generation forever because it is the subject that people never stop talking about. It's always a hot subject. It is such a simple story. I mean, it's a story you could find in the Bible. It probably is in the Bible, you know, a man, woman, and other woman, infidelity. I think it holds up because it's elemental. I think it touches on human weakness and mistakes that can be made. I think any good story is universal in its uh, connection to some very, very basic human traits, and I think this, this movie fulfills that. I think it's pretty timeless that way.